This commuter train takes thousands of people into the city every day. All over the world, thousands of commuter trains and thousands of intercity trains transport millions and millions of people every day. Very few people stop to wonder what determines the dimensions of these trains. The majority of these trains are the same width, or to put it better, they run on rails that have the same distance between them. This is known as the gauge. Between 55 and 60% of all railway lines worldwide run on the same width, the same gauge, known as standard gauge, which is four feet, eight and a half inches, or 1,435 millimetres. If we calculate the mileage of standard gauge worldwide, the percentage would be even higher. Why does this Rome commuter train use the same gauge as most trains in the UK, China, the USA and a host of other countries around the world? Like so many questions about the modern world, we have to go back to the north of England more than 200 years ago to get the answer. Railways had existed in the northeast of England since the late Middle Ages. They were originally constructed to transport coal from mines to the ports, mainly for export to London. Coal was becoming more and more important because of Europe-wide deforestation. These railways were called wagonways. A horse could pull less than a tonne of coal on a normal road of the period. On smooth wooden and later even smoother iron rails, they could easily pull five tonnes with less effort. A standard gauge was agreed between the mine owners so that all their wagons could use all the wagonways. This was four feet eight and a half inches. This was the rail gauge that could accommodate a horse between the rails. In fact, the wagonways didn't use long wooden sleepers that we associate with railways today, but small stone sleepers, which enabled the horse to walk between the rails without tripping. Early railways pulled by steam locomotives continued to use these stone sleepers, but they were soon replaced with long wooden sleepers because they were cheaper and gave a much smoother ride to passengers. Lumps of coal don't usually complain about discomfort. During the railway building boom from the 1830s onwards, standard gauge was adopted and no one thought any more about it. This was not the only gauge in use, however. In the same period as the Industrial Revolution massively increased the demand for housing and factories, there was a boom in slate mining. After all, if you build more houses and factories, the roofing materials have to come from somewhere. As slate mines tended to be in mountainous areas, building railways to move the slate out cheaply and quickly was a challenge. For this reason, they tended to build narrow gauge railways, generally a two foot gauge. Why did they build a two-foot gauge? Railways in mountainous areas tend to have lots of tunnels, bridges, cuttings and embankments. If you were building a narrower railway, you massively reduced the engineering challenges and the cost. Narrow gauge railways had the added advantage that they could build tighter curves. As a general rule, the narrower the gauge, the sharper corners you can have. However, the majority of the railways were made with standard gauge. As trains and railways were exported to the rest of the world, the British standard gauge, four foot eight and a half inches, or 1,435 millimetres, was adopted in most places, with some form of narrow gauge being adopted for mountainous areas. And here things might have stopped, but there was a new kid on the block. In 1835, only five years after the first intercity railway between Liverpool and Manchester was built, Parliament approved the construction of a railway linking London to Bristol. This became the Great Western Railway. The new kid in question was an already famous engineer with the wonderful name of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. I won't go into details of his achievements in this video. To do him justice would take at least an hour at the very least. Suffice it to say that he was a man with a vision. 
a man who wanted his railway to stand out from all the others in terms of speed, comfort and beauty. The cornerstone of his vision was a wide gauge railway. He planned to build the Great Western Railway not with the northern gauge, often referred to as the Stevenson gauge, four foot eight and a half inches, named after George Stevenson, the builder of the first railways in the north. His gauge would be much wider, seven foot and a quarter inches, or 2,140 millimetres. Why did he do this? As we've already seen, the wider the gauge, the greater the cost. So what were the advantages? There were several. First, as you can see here, with this wide gauge train of the period, the payload is much greater because the train is wider and can carry more freight or passengers for the length. However, even if it is wider, the wheels are still closer to the side of the engine and the wagons. This provides a much smoother and far less bumpy ride, and early trains were bumpy enough. This stability also meant that trains could run faster. Brunel believed that speed would convert all the mainline train companies to wide gauge sooner or later. Brunel tested this by practicing a very rare skill that he had on both wide gauge trains and standard gauge trains. It is said that he was one of the very few people who could draw a perfect circle freehand, and he demonstrated this skill while riding on a wide gauge train. But when he tried to do this on a standard gauge train, he found it was impossible. This, he said, demonstrated the smoothness and comfort of travel on the GWR. In order to reduce the number of cuttings and embankments along the route, the Great Western Railway often took detours around hills to keep to the same contour. While the directors of the Great Western Railway often dubbed the GWR as God's Wonderful Railway, GWR's detractors often dubbed it as the Great Way Round because of the long detours. In any case, the Great Western Railway was a success and spread all over the southeast of England, the West Midlands and South Wales and became one of the biggest railway companies in the country. White Gauge also spread to other countries, particularly India. Many Great Western Railway engineers were involved in the development of the Indian Rail Network from the 1850s onwards. Although the gauge was less than that of the GWR at 5 feet 6 inches or 1,676 millimetres, many of these wide gauge railways still exist in India to this day. GWR went from strength to strength and continued to build with wide or broad gauge as they called it. In the rest of the country, standard gauge was dominant, as it was in most countries where railways were being built all over the world. The problem was when you had to move between one railway to another. At any interchange between GWR and other railways, the trains could not run on each other's tracks, and so everything or everybody who had to transfer from one train to another, and this caused chaos in stations all over the country. Pressure was put on the government to force GWR to conform to the rest of the country. GWR resisted with PR and lobbying campaigns. This was known as the Gauge Wars. In later years, GWR, in an attempt to preserve its wide gauge, experimented with putting a third rail on many of their tracks. This third rail meant that wide gauge and standard gauge trains could use the same train tracks, but the GWR trains couldn't use standard gauge tracks. It worked for straight pieces of track but didn't really work at intersections and the point systems were phenomenally complicated. In the end, Parliament passed a law forcing all mainline railway companies to conform to standard gauge. On the weekend of the 20th to the 23rd of May 1892, the last stretch of broad gauge railway that ran between Paddington in London and Penzance in Cornwall was ripped up. Standard gauge had won the day. Was it a good decision? There are a lot of things to be said for wide gauge railways even today, but in railway technology, like in any others, certain standards need to be observed if you're going to be part of a wider international network. 
it was relatively easy for GWR to convert to standard gauge. They just ended up with a lot of extra wide tunnels and bridges. The cost of converting from wide gauge to narrow gauge isn't so great. The opposite would cost a fortune. Wide gauge GWR style is one of history's might have beens. There are so many. Well, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please click the like buttons and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Bye for now.